Operation Overlord, the Allied invasion of Europe, was the largest seaborne invasion in history. It involved land, sea and air troops of all nations, and ultimately led to the Allied victory in Europe and the end of the Second World War. Initial plans for the landings began in August 1943, and were led by General Dwight D. Eisenhower, head of Schaefe, the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. Overlord had been months in the planning. Analysis of possible landing sites, specialist vehicles and deception plans had been carefully considered and developed. The landing itself was to be codenamed Operation Neptune, but this is more commonly referred to as D-Day. Overlord and D-Day itself is a vast complex subject, and in this video I shall attempt to tell the story of several aircraft involved in and around the events of the 6th of June 1944. 1,200 aircraft of all types were involved in D-Day, and together they formed the 2nd Tactical Air Force. This comprised transports dropping paratroops, assault gliders, heavy bombers laying false radar trails, through to fighters and ground attack aircraft. Uniquely, they were to carry the now famous black and white invasion stripes. The stripes were intended to prevent friendly fire incidents from both ground forces and other aircraft. Instructions for squadrons to paint the stripes on their aircraft was only issued on the 3rd of June. The invasion was originally planned to take place on June the 5th, but bad weather resulted in postponement until the 6th. Early in the morning of June the 6th, 1944, the invasion force left their moorings on the south coast of England and set course for northern France. Vulnerable to attack, this vast armada needed anti-shipping and air cover and this was to be provided by Coastal Command, and in particular, Bowfighters. The Bowfighter had been developed from the Beaufort as a heavy fighter, and fared well as a night fighter. It evolved with more powerful engines, and was adopted by Coastal Command in an anti-shipping role, air-launching the British 18-inch torpedo, and given the nickname Torbo by the press. Further developments resulted in the Mark 10, which had a rear-facing 303 machine gun in the observer's position, and the ability to carry bombs or rocket projectiles under the wings. The Mark 10 was produced in considerable numbers. NE355 was one of nearly 2,100 built at Western Supermare. By 1943, the focus of Coastal Command's operations was moving more towards anti-shipping, and dedicated strike wings were formed on the east coast of Scotland and England, covering the North Sea. The Canadian 404 Squadron joined 144 Squadron as the Wick Wing in 1943. With the build-up in the south of England in the approach to D-Day, the wing was moved to the southwest, arriving at Davidstow Moor in Cornwall at the beginning of May. On D-Day, the squadron had been busy trying to find and sink German e-boats, but their main success came later in the day, when armed with 20-pound rockets, the strike wing sighted three German destroyers. Attacking from close range with their cannon and rocket salvos, the strike wing badly damaged two of the destroyers, and probably sank the third. This was Coastal Command's most spectacular operation on D-Day. Three days later, another destroyer was beached after a further 404 squadron attack. A total of 218 sorties were flown that month. By early August, the wing was no longer needed for post-overlord operations. The squadron returned north, working with the North Coats Wing, based on the Lincolnshire coast covering the Dutch waters. There they contributed to the tremendous success of the wing, which accounted for the sinking of 117 vessels, amounting to 150,000 tonnes of shipping. The North Coats Strike Wing operated the largest anti-shipping force of the Second World War, and was responsible for half the total tonnage sunk by all strike wings between 1942 and 1945. Fighter cover was essential on D-Day, and squadrons were grouped together in wings across the south of England. One such wing was based at Calmhead in Devon, and led by Battle of Britain ace Pete Brothers. In April 1944, he became leader of the Exeter Wing, which was made up of five squadrons of Spitfires and one of Typhoons. In preparations for D-Day, the wing was divided, with Wing Commander Bird Wilson taking on the Harrow Beer Wing and Pete Brothers with what was now the Calmhead Wing. 
The Mark 9 Spitfire originated as an interim solution to a pressing problem and became the most numerous Mark with over 5,500 produced. With the introduction of the Focke-Wulf 190 and in particular cross-channel operations, the Spitfire Mark V struggled and its planned successor, the Mark VIII, was still under development. However, the next generation of Rolls-Royce Merlin, the 60 series, with its two-stage supercharger, was available, and this was fitted to the Mark V airframe. The only visual difference being a slightly longer nose and a four-bladed propeller. The Spitfire Mark IX had two wing variants. The C-wing carried two 20mm cannon inboard of the 303 machine guns, while the E-wing had the cannon moved to the outboard position, with the inner now housing a .5 machine gun. As with all aircraft to be flown on D-Day, ML214 was painted with the black and white invasion stripes. As always, with such widespread and hasty applications, there were variations, and those allocated to the Air Defence of Britain aircraft were frequently narrower than those more standard stripes worn by the 2nd Tactical Air Force. By the end of 1944, these stripes had been shed stage by stage, with many aircraft reverting to their original colours by October. ML214 became the aircraft of squadron leader Johnny Plagis, when he took over the squadron shortly after D-Day, by which time the Allies had achieved total air supremacy. In July 1936, Hawkers, led by Sidney Cam, submitted to the Air Ministry their ideas for a successor to the Hurricane. This was to be powered by one of a new generation of engines, giving twice the power of the Merlin. This resulted in the Tornado and Typhoon, two aircraft with the same basic airframe but with different engines. The Napier Sabre-powered Typhoon first flew in February 1940. With the role of the fighter taken by the Spitfire, an aircraft capable of ground support was essential on D-Day. The aircraft ideally suited to this role was to be the Hawker Typhoon. By June 1944, 20 Typhoon squadrons in this role formed part of the 2nd Tactical Air Force. As part of its structure, 174, 175 and 245 Typhoon squadrons based at West Hampnet formed a wing and the three squadrons remained a unit until the end of hostilities. They moved on the 1st of April 1944 to Homesley South, one of the many airfields in the New Forest that were part of the springboard for the coming operation. By this time, Typhoon squadrons were specialising in either bombing or rocket projectile operations, with the underwing fittings permanently installed. 245 Squadron's weapon of choice was the rocket projectile, which they carried until the end of hostilities in Europe. As with all the Typhoon squadrons, 245 were in action early on the 6th of June. Half of these squadrons attacked nominated targets, while the others waited in airborne readiness just offshore to be called forward if a new target presented itself. With the black and white distinctive markings carefully applied to the aircraft, both the individual letter and serial were left visible. MN625 joined the squadron and was flown by Flying Officer W. Smith, who a few days later was the first Allied pilot to land at one of the temporary airfields on the continent, in this case B-5 Camilli. This airfield became the squadron's operating base for the next two months before the Allied advance continued. More than 500 Typhoons were lost on post-D-Day operations, but less than 50 in air-to-air -air combat. They had themselves claimed 50 kills. The Typhoon has now become symbolic of the Army support task post-D-Day, aided perhaps by its very pugnacious appearance and the combination of the classic D-Day stripes and the 60-pound rockets it carried. During the first 24 hours of Operation Overlord, the Allied Air Forces flew a total of 14,674 sorties for the loss of 113 aircraft, many by friendly fire. Such was the Allied air supremacy that the Luftwaffe only flew 319 sorties in the same period. The elaborate deception plans made by the Allies during the months prior to D-Day had certainly paid off. The Messerschmitt Bf 109 was the subject of continuous development. The G-series, or Gustav as it was widely known, was considered by some experts to be the most efficient of the type. 
However, by mid-1944, age had begun to catch up with the BF-109G. It was no longer able to engage contemporary Allied fighters such as the Spitfire Mark IX and the Mustang Mark III on equal terms. Nonetheless, the Gustav made a formidable antagonist for Allied bombers with its heavy firepower, reasonable overtaking speed and small target profile. To counter increasing enemy night activity over the Reich territories, Jagdgeschwader 301 was formed in October 1943 as a single-seat, free-ranging night fighter unit. Fighters were not directed using the tactical guidance of radar ground stations to the target. Instead, interception was based after radio guidance to the general area of the bomber stream on the pilot's vision and personal judgment. These became known as wild sow operations. July 1944 was another busy month for the defenders of the Reich and their opponents. In the early hours of the 21st of July, Lieutenant Horst Prenzel, the staffel captain of 1JG301, landed his BF109G6 U2, White 16, at RAF Manston by mistake, after an uneventful wild sow sortie over the Normandy invasion area. Prior to his capture, Lieutenant Prenzel participated in 25 operational flights and scored two victories. The RAF evaluated the aircraft at the Royal Aircraft Establishment Farnborough and then passed it to the Air Fighting Development Unit at RAF Wittering in August 1944. Like other G6U2 variants of the 109, Prenzel's aircraft incorporated a GM1 system for injecting nitrous oxide into the engine. A distinguishing feature of the aircraft was the redesigned fin and rudder. The enlarged rudder utilised a mass balance instead of the previous horn balance. The aircraft sported the red fuselage band, indicative of early wild sow units. Messerschmitt continued to develop the 109 throughout the war, up to the final K series, but the highly successful Gustav became the most numerous of the 33,984 BF-109s produced. These aircraft played just a small part of the Allied invasion of Europe, but without which D-Day would not have been the success it was. They allowed the troops to form a bridgehead from which more forces would land and gradually liberate Europe over the following months. I hope you found my video interesting. You may well enjoy some of the others in my channel. Please feel free to like, comment and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching.